Professor Zenon Kohut, but I am sure there is no need to introduce Zenon Kohut, uh, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Alberta in this audience. Uh, he has been present in the Ukrainian scholarly world for a long time, and in my opinion, he has significantly influenced the development of uh, research on the Ukrainian long 18th century. Uh, so let me just uh, recall a few important facts. Uh, a Ukrainian translation of Professor uh, Zen, uh, Kohut's uh, monograph uh, about the Hetmanate and the Russian centralism was published uh, uh, 25 years ago and it was one of the uh, first uh, recent Western studies to become available for a wide community of Ukrainian historians um, I think this book has uh, contributed to professional formation of many of the conference participants from Ukraine present here. Uh, in uh, particular, it offered a methodological and uh, theoretical framework uh, which remains suitable uh, for study uh, of various aspects of history of the Cossack Ukraine. When the book appeared in Ukrainian, uh, I was at the beginning uh, of my student life. At that time, the history of the 18th century was taught in Ukrainian uh, universities in a completely different uh, way than Professor Kohut proposed. Uh, it's interesting, this uh, monograph uh, remains absolutely uh, relevant today and we keep offering it to uh, our students as a mandatory reading. Uh, Professor uh, Zenon Kohut studies deal not only uh, with Ukrainians long 18th century but uh, more bro broadly with the early modern period. Various aspects of uh, political history, ideology, uh, history of historical writing, history of ideas uh, and identi identity from the second half of the um, 17th to the early 19th century have been in his uh, sites. His articles uh, dealing with these issues were collected in two volumes. Um, First, uh, entitled Roots of Identity Studies uh, on Early Modern and Modern Ukraine appeared in uh, Ukrainian in uh, 2004. Uh, second, entitled Making Ukraine Studies on Political Culture, Historical Narrative and Identity came out in English seven years later. Uh, but uh, uh, his role is not limited uh, only to research. Uh, Professor Kohut's uh, extremely important and long uh, career as a director of Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies uh, cannot be overlooked. Uh, um, this institution, which became a sponsor uh, and co-organizer of our conference, many thanks, uh, has done uh, a lot uh, to promote uh, knowledge about Ukraine and its history on the West. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the extensive grant programs for Ukrainian researchers uh, have been and remain extremely important in the 1990s and early uh, 2000s. Kyiv's uh, grants were one of the few possibilities for Ukrainian historians to visit archives uh, abroad. I know this from my own experience because 20 years ago as a PhD student, thanks to Kyiv's grant, I had the opportunity to work for a month in the archive of uh, Petersburg, And uh, then I uh, uh, had been living in the heart of Petersburg near Winter Palace. Uh, uh, a number of important studies dealing, dealing, dealing with the 18th century history were published in Ukraine with the support of Kyus when uh, uh, it was headed by Professor Kohut. Uh, a noteworthy fact that uh, Professor Kohut uh, has been exploring the um, 18th century history of Ukraine already for a half of a century. And now, as far as I know, he has been uh, writing a new book about the political culture of, uh, uh, of the Hetmanate. And uh, um, the spoiler was yesterday on the panel uh, one, uh, 
Uh, I hope, uh, Professor Kohut, uh, you will tell us, among others, about uh, uh, this new, uh, your project. Um, and uh, um, thank you for uh, acceptation our, invita uh, our invitation. And I very much look forward to uh, your lecture and to uh, story about your encounters with early modern Ukrainian history. Uh, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, um, so my encounter with um, uh, early modern history, um, uh, let me see. Uh, so dear colleagues, um, I am pleased and grateful for the honor of presenting this keynote address to the first conference of the Ukrainian Society for 18th Century Studies. The conference organizers had asked me to reflect on my personal experience in encountering 18th century Ukraine. In considering this request, I came to the realization that my encounter was much broader than 18th century Ukraine and included the entire period of early modern Ukraine, which I defined as stemming from the Union of Lublin in 1569 until the 1820s. Moreover, I divide early modern Ukrainian history in two distinct periods, from 1569 to the 1720s. And the 1720s to the 1820s. Both periods deal with the 18th century. Thus my talk will be on encountering early modern Ukraine instead of really encountering 18th century Ukraine. My, my encounter with early modern Ukraine began in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. At that time, Pennsylvania had two Russian historians that is, Alexander Razanovsky in early Russian history period, uh, Kiev and Rus in actuality, and Alfred J. Reber for modern Russia. Before I left, Pen Moshe Lewin was added for Soviet history, was, which was just at that time coming in as a field. Also, the university had a rather distinguished Czech historian, Otakar Odlozilek, who was covering East Central Europe. <clears throat> My progress was normal in coursework, general exams, and then came thesis time. In one of my seminars with Reber, I produced a large work on the beginning of modern Ukrainian political thought in the 19th century. And one of the elements of this was the role of the Cossack autonomy literature, such as Historia Rusev and other works. Soon, I ended up in 18th century studies with my thesis on the abolition of Cossack autonomy. Somehow, Reber looked favorably on such a topic. Maybe he was afraid that with a more modern topic, my supposed Ukrainian nationalism would appear. But then, how could one pursue such a thesis at the University of Pennsylvania, where not a single faculty member <clears throat> knew anything about, <clears throat> about the topic, and the Penn Library did not have the resources to support such a research project. <clears throat> Fortunately, at this time, the Harvard project was just beginning. The chairs were not yet funded, but a program had been initiated by Professor Pritzak, and Professor Reber allowed me to explore the possibility of engaging Harvard into my research project. At the same time, Professor Pritzak was searching for students, disciples really. Thus began my Harvard experience. What, with my arrival at Harvard in 1969, I was thrust fully into the Harvard project from coursework to fundraising. For the first time, I took courses at a university level on Ukrainian history with Professor Pritzak, and more importantly for me, Professor Alexander Hloblin. 
who at that time was the leading authority on Cossack Ukraine anywhere, including Soviet Ukraine. My university was accommodating, even appointing Professor Holoban as an additional thesis advisor, but everything did not work out so smoothly. <laughs> as part of my research, I was supposed to go to Ukraine on an IREX exchange, uh, the International Research Exchange Board, and was accepted for this. Two weeks before my trip, I was finally denied a visa to the Soviet Union. I was hardly shocked by this denial, but it brings out an important point. The, the capacity of the Soviets to shape the field of Russian and Soviet studies in the United States by their ability to ultimately determine who goes and what topics could be studied. <clears throat> it was crucial that one would have this firsthand experience to be really a legitimate scholar, to at least get to the first tier of universities. But then one had to pick topics acceptable to the Soviets. Combined with the fact that Russian history was saturated by the students of Michael Karpovich of Harvard, who from the late 1940s to the early uh, 1950s produced a whole array of scholars who followed the Russian imperial paradigm, these two factors also made any breakthrough for any Ukrainian history project problematic, including, of course, early modern studies. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I persisted. I refocused my thesis on the broad interpretive study on the integration of Ukraine into the Russian Empire. In 1975, I successfully defended my doc doctoral dissertation the abolition of Ukrainian autonomy, 1783 to 1786, a case study uh, in the integration of a non-Russian area into the empire. Although there were numerous works devoted to the problem of 18th century Ukrainian history, this topic had never been studied, at least at the level of a monograph. I became the first historian to reconstruct and generalize the incorporation of ancien regime Ukrainian society into imperial structures, as well as the fate of the social, political, and intellectual components of the Cossack state after its demise. <clears throat> my dissertation and my later monograph based on it synthesized all that had previously been written on the topic. Moreover, I was able to utilize the vast amount of documentation that had been published, and my stay at Harvard enabled me to tap these resources at Widener Library. This work was published in 1988 as Russian Centralism and Ukrainian Autonomy, Imperial Absorption of the Ukrainian Hetmanate, 1760s to 1830s, and in Ukraine in 1996. <clears throat> My book was well received. For example, Mark Ryoff of Columbia University stated it was an authoritative study examining the relationship between Ukraine and Russia in the 18th century. And Isabel de Madriaga, the leading scholar of the Katharinian period, also concluded that it will be the standard work on a formative period in Ukrainian history. This study also fitted well into a growing field of research on early modern European state building, so much so that I was invited to contribute to a collective work on conquest and coalescence, the shaping of the state in early modern European Europe, edited by Mark Greengrass. <clears throat> In this work, nine scholars examined the piecemeal appropriation and integration of lands into states to determine the state pattern of ancient regime Europe. Some of the examples included Ireland, Flanders, Poland, uh, uh, Portugal, Bohemia, as well as Ukraine. <clears throat> Despite of the positive response to my thesis, I struggled in establishing myself in academia. 
for the academic year 1975-76, I did receive an appointment as visiting lecturer in the Department of History at the University of Pennsylvania, and subsequently obtained a two-year position at Michigan State University in 1979. However, in an era of severe cutbacks in higher education, I was forced to work outside of academic institutions from 1980 to 1992, and my research and publication opportunities were somewhat limited. In 1992, I was offered a position at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta. This occurred during Ukraine's drive toward independence. In fact, Ukraine declared its independence when I was in Edmonton to be interviewed for this position. Soon afterwards, I became acting director and then director in 1995 of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, a position I held until 2012. <clears throat> Work on my thesis and book confronted me with the issues of Ukrainian-Russian relations, and particularly the role of the Russo-Ukrainian unity myth. This myth has been so pervasive that even today, with the existence of an independent Ukraine, many still believe that historically, linguistically, culturally, and even spiritually, Ukraine is or should be part of Russia. What are the origins of such views? When and how did they develop? Much of my subsequent research attempted to provide answer to these questions. In question of Russo-Ukrainian unity and Ukrainian distinctiveness in early modern Ukrainian thought and culture, I argued that in the case of Poland-Lithuanian, Ruthenians subscribed to political unity, yet insisted on religious and cultural differences. As these and other attempted arrangements with Poland-Lithuania proved unworkable, some Ukrainians began looking for Sokar to Muscovy. In the pro-Muscovite orientations, Ukrainians claimed affinity with Muscovy in religion, dynasty, high culture, and at times even ethnicity. However, they insisted on maintaining their distinctiveness in political, social, and occasional ecclesiastical structure. The claim to distinctiveness proved so strong that it even survived the abolition of a separate Ukrainian political, uh, separate Ukrainian political and juridical institutions. <clears throat> In addressing uh, <clears throat> the Ukrainian-Russian entanglement, I also focused on the evolution of the traditional scheme of Russian history, a grand narrative of the origins and evolution of the Russian Empire and Ukraine's role in conceptualizing such a narrative. That's the publication of the synopsis. The imperial grand narrative combined dynastic religious, imperial, and Russian national history in order to present a virtually unbroken thousand-year story of Russia and the Russian people. It is this narrative that Ukrainians and Russians are treated as offshoots of the same people, sharing a common history, historical legacy, a common Orthodox faith, and therefore a common national destiny. <clears throat> The study of the evolution of the traditional scheme and Ukraine's response to it required delving more deeply into Russian, Polish, and Ukrainian historiography. How did a Ukrainian national narrative evolve considering the negation of Ukraine as a distinct historical entity by the two dominant historiographic traditions in Ukraine, the Imperial Russian and Polish? I studied the path toward the establishment of Ukrainian national historiography. At first, the Ukrainian gentry historians wanted simply to modify the imperial grand narrative, to establish within the Russian traditional scheme a suitable and honorable place for Ukraine and Ukrainian history. The romantic populist challenged the Russian grand narratives more directly by countering 
the imperial state with the separate development and identity of the Ukrainian people. At the same time, Ukrainian historians were able gradually to demolish the Polish myth. Despite the increasing emphasis on Ukrainian distinctiveness, Ukrainian historians and other intellectuals did not yet sever the Russian connection. Their purpose was to develop a distinct Ukrainian nation and historiography within a meta-Russian nationality and state. Only towards the end of the 19th century did certain Ukrainian intellectuals begin to posit that Ukraine was separate from Russia in all respects, language, literature, culture, history, and politics. Most of my work was concentrated on the Hetmanate, the polity established by Hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky and which existed in various forms until the late 18th century. My, uh, my first book traced the last stages of the Hetmanate's existence and its lingering influence in the early 19th century. Now I began work on various aspects from the Hetmanate's pre-origins to its end. That placed uh, me chronologically well prior to the 18th century. In studying the Hetmanate, I was struck by the Cossacks' leadership, two overlapping and sometimes conflicting state building projects. A polity of the Ruthenian nation carved out of the Ruthenian lands of the Kingdom of Poland, and a polity of the Zaporozhian host based on the Cossack claimed territories of central Ukraine. It is unclear how these two projects could have been united. Would the entire Ruthenian policy be taken over by the host and structured to fit the regimental Cossack system? How would this be possible in the large areas where there were no Cossacks? Nevertheless, I discovered that the territorial delineation combining Cossack Ukraine with the Ruthenian lands of the Kingdom of Poland was vigorously pursued as a political project by Hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky, was included in the proposal for the Union of Hadyach, and held by both Hetman Petro Doroshenko and Hetman Ivan Samilovich. This indicates a persistent territorial concept of, of Ukraine that extended beyond the Cossack lands. Much of my work was centered on the Ukrainian elite. I studied the evolution of the Cossack Stashina into a Shlachta-like gentry and its ultimate integration into the Russian nobility. My monograph on the integration of the Hetmanate into the Russian Empire focused on the political thought of the Ukrainian elite and their relationship to the idea of Russian Empire. I introduced the conceptual structure dividing the elite at the end of the Hetmanate's existence into assimilators and traditionalists and linked the discourse between them as a further step in the evolution of the Ukrainian national movement of the 19th century. Over the course of my work, I've traced the formation of a little Russian identity by this elite and posed the question to what extent the Little Russian identity was a step in Ukrainian nation building, or alternatively, a state in the formation of an all Russian identity. Many of my works have also focused on the evolution of political concepts among the Ukrainian secular elite, particularly the meaning of such terms as fatherland and nation, and their persistence as references to Ukraine rather than the Russian Empire. I demonstrated how in a period of two decades, that 1660s and 1680s, the Cossack elite underwent a, underwent a major shift in group identity from considering as its fatherland, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in favor of a Cossack Ukrainian Little Russian polity and that all major political actors in Cossack Ukraine accepted and adopted this concept, and that by the late 1680s, the idea of a Ukrainian Little Russian fatherland had become entrenched 
in early modern Ukrainian political culture. Finally, I point to the long-term consequence of this identity shift uh, on relations with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Muscovy, Russia, and the emergence of a modern Ukrainian identity. I also investigated the evolution of the concept of an early modern Ruthenian Ukrainian Little Russian nation. It is clear that in the mid 17th century, such a nation was primarily a cultural and linguistic concept. However, from the founding of the Hetmanate, the idea of nation assumed certain political and constitutional elements approximating those of a political nation. Thus, the polity established by Bogdan Khmelnytsky was that of the host of Zaporozhian Cossacks and the Ruthenian nation. If one looks at the accords of Khmelnytsky or subsequent hetmans, whether with Poland or with Moscovy, there are always specific articles dealing with the right of the Cossack host and the nation. In subsequent agreement, the terms used for the nation varies. There are references to Ruthenian, Ukrainian, or Little Russian nation. The issue of nationhood is further complicated by the ambiguity of the term narod, which may signify a nation or people of a specific land. Thus, I attempted to identify instances when narod referred to a political nation, a cultural ethnic community, or simply to the inhabitants of those, of those lands. <clears throat> In my work on early modern Ukraine, I relied heavily on the robust development of scholarship in this field. In this talk, I can mention only a few names that had particular impact on my thinking on the subject. The pioneering work of Teresa Czuzewska Heno on national consciousness among nobles and Cossacks in Ukraine in the late 16th and early 17th centuries and Natalia Kovenko's monograph on the Ukrainian nobility, and her later writings on the thought and political culture of Ukraine formed the background for my views. These were honed further by my close association with two colleagues, Frank Sisson and Serhii Plouquet. My association with Frank Sisson stemmed from our Harvard days and it lasted now for five decades. On a professional level, we have created a laboratory for early modern Ukrainian history. Not only did we discuss our research, publications, conference papers, but we also attempted to develop the field. As such, we initiated a series of conferences, workshops, and published their results. It was particularly gratifying to see a major work on ethnicity and nationalism base its views on Ukraine on these publication. And here I'm talking about uh, the book by uh, Azar Gat, uh, Nations, the Long History and Deep Roots of Political Ethnicity and Nationalism. So um, this, uh, it was, uh, this laboratory of early modern history was reassembled at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies in the 1990s. Frank Sisson arrived at the Institute from the United States, then I came in 1992, and soon to be joined by Serhii Plouquet. It, uh, I might also add, uh, uh, the University uh, had also Natalia Pelepiuk that de dealt in this, in this area, and uh, 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 the, uh, for her first name, uh, Pogosyanov, who also did a lot of work on early modern, uh, not Ukraine, but early modern uh, Russia. Thus, the core of early modernist was formed. Uh, Frank Sisson organized a working group centered on the Hushevsky translation project. For the next 15 years, CIS did function as a laboratory of early modern Ukrainian history. The many seminars, conferences, articles, and books, but most importantly, the virtually daily uh, interaction made CIUS a potent laboratory of early modern history. 
In 2007, well, he left CIS to assume the Hoshevsky professorship at Harvard and subsequently pursued a more, more modern fields of research. Nevertheless, the CIUS early modern laboratory continued to flourish with new initiatives, projects, and publications. One of the products of this laboratory is a book that I'm currently completing on the political culture of Cossack Ukraine. This book represents the culmination of four decades of my work on these topics. Thus, in this work, I built upon my previous studies on concepts of fatherland, Ukrainian, Ukrainian, Little Russian, nation, Narod, Cossack liberties, and issues regarding Ukrainian-Russian relations, and provide a systemic and comprehensive synthesis. This book will be focusing what I consider major components of early modern Ukrainian political thought and culture. Concepts of Ruthenian Ukrainian little Russian nation and people, the role of the Orthodox faith, a Ruthenian Ukrainian territorial and political entity, the privileges of the Cossack host, and various visions of Ukraine, little Rus, and the concepts of Ukrainian Belarus fatherland. Another persistent theme in Ukrainian political thought was the Ukrainian Belarus nation as a free nation, never having been conquered, and, and that submitted itself to its rulers voluntarily with the recognition of its perpetual rights and liberties. At the same time, this study will also, also deals with the concept emanating from the synopsis of Ukraine and Russia being part of a continuous slavano russian Tsar stemming from Kiev and Rus, thus justifying perpetual Tsarist rule. Chronologically, the book spans from 1569 to 1714. Its starting point is the Union of Lublin when three Ruthenian, or as they were frequently called, Ukrainian Palatinates, Volinia, Bratislaw, and Kiev, were transferred from the Grand Duchy of Lithuania to the Kingdom of Poland in the establishment of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Joined after 1635 by the Czerniu Palatinate, these incorporated lands were increasingly seen as a Rus entity and the embodiment of the rights of a Ruthenian nation that freely joined the Polish and Lithuanian nations. The book closes with the Bandera Constitution and the creation of Orlik's grand narrative of Cossack autonomy, antiquity, legitimacy, and perpetual rights. This also closes the formative period of Ukrainian political culture. In the next period between 1720s and 1820s, the Ukrainian elite attempted to apply various aspects of political culture within very changed political cir circumstances. The verdict of Poltava placed the hetmanate under severe constraints imposed by Russia. At the same time, Moscow was transformed into the Russian Empire and developed an imperial ideology. Nevertheless, the Ukrainian elite was able to preserve various aspects of this culture up to the 1820s. In the epilogue, I will try to present some of the most salient features of these processes based primarily on my previous research and observation. Such a summary serves to connect early modern Ukrainian political thought and culture from its 16th century origins to modern times and modern nation building and identities. <clears throat> A number of historians question or reject entirely the paradigm of national history. Andriy Pertnov, Tatyana Pertnova, Serhii Savchenko, and Victoria Serhianku indicate how at numerous times various elements of the Ukrainian national history narrative have been deconstructed and criticized by Ukrainian historians 
so much so that this narrative no longer has the validity. However, these partial revisions, this is a quote, were always marginalized and rebuffed by the very fact that they did not fit the established, coherent, and all-embracing master narrative, but also did not offer any equally comprehensive alternative story. Jorge Kasyanov warned against the archaization of terms national and national consciousness. That is common among the historians who deal with early modern Ukrainian history of the 16th and 17th centuries. At the same time, Kasyanov recognized that, quote, preconditions for the formation of certain forms of consciousness existed in the 16th and 17th centuries, and later, much later, it began to be called national and the formation of which took place in the following centuries. While I certainly agree with Kasyanov on the existence of certain pre-modern proto-national consciousness, I do not accept the idea that this consciousness can only serve as some sort of depository from which 19th and 20th century historians can draw from while inventing the nation. To my mind, the political thought and culture of Cossack Ukraine forms a distinct stage and foundation in the evolution of concepts of a Ukrainian state and nation. It is my conviction that all political thought and national identities are constructed usually as the result of many-sided dialogues among competitors. As, state, as stated by Michel de Sertu, Collective identities are inherently dynamic and unstable and can be infused with conflicting meanings and employed for disparate purposes. Finally, that the clear-cut opposition between inheritance, continuity, and rupture invention of national identity is artificial, as cultural products are neither made from scratch nor ossified but repeatedly reassembled from the items at hand." End of quote. Therefore, the Ruthenian nation of nobles was constructed. The idea of a Ruthenian Cossack nation was constructed. The concept of Slavo-Russian people was constructed. The grand narrative of Cossack chronicles were constructed. Each of these constructions reflected the political thought and culture of the time without being part of any overreaching project such as Ukrainian nationhood. I do not subscribe to the notion of a perennial people nation that evolves through time, exhibiting different forms of expression and culminating in the modern nation state. However, I do believe that the various constructs operating in Cossack Ukraine whether of the Ruthenian nobility, the Kievan clergy, or the Cossacks were interrelated, interrelated with some elements passing from one strand to another and from one chronological period to another. Other elements were dropped, some were reanimated in other time frame. Yet this political culture had considerable cohesiveness and continuity. Moreover, moreover it produced a historical narrative that made Ukrainian history distinct from Polish and Russian history. It defined a historical space that could not be readily assimilated into the histories of the region's dominant nation. Thus, it fulfilled the task of a national history. I do recognize the profound differences between early modern and modern views of Ukrainian identity and nationhood. In the first instance, they were the expression of an elite, nobles, Cossack officers, and higher clergy, who are asserting their political, religious, and territorial rights, while in modern Ukrainian nation building, the national leaders were attempting to raise an ethnic community to a politically conscious nation. However, I do believe that there wasn't, that I do not believe that there was a complete rupture between the early modern and modern. As stated by Andreas Kepler, the pre-modern history of the ethnic groups that were part of the multi-ethnic Russian empire was, quote, 
also of significance in that it constitutes the prehistory of nations, which in the 19th and 20th century did not suddenly appear from nowhere, end of quote. In my view, the modern Ukrainian identity would not be possible without its pre-modern roots, and that Ukrainian political thought and culture were indeed, quote, repeatedly reassembled from the items at hand. Each reassembly represented a stage in the evolution of Ukrainian political thought and culture, and in my mind, a stage in Ukrainian nation building. Thus, Hrushevsky's reassembly contained not only a new emphasis on the Ukrainian masses, but also the idea of the routine nation of the nobles, the routine Cossack idea, a rejection of the concept of a Slavano Russian people and the adoption of the historical periodization of Safanovich Chronicle and the concept of Ukraine as a fatherland. In, in the ever evolving construction and reconstruction of Ukrainian political thought, there were a myriad of concepts, projects, and identities. In addition to the envisioning of a Ruthenian little Russian Ukrainian nation people, there, were, there was a short lived notion of Rus Cossack Ukraine within the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Other concepts, such as Slavana Russian people and of a little Russia within an all Russian empire, resonate even today. Thus, the construction of the political culture and thought of Cossack Ukraine should be viewed as a multi layered process in both history and geography, with all its continuities, discontinuities, and contradictions. Nevertheless, this cauldron of constructs was fundamental for the envisioning of modern identities and sense of nationhood. Thus, the political culture, thought and culture of Cossack Ukraine can be considered an aspect in Ukrainian and to some extent Russian state and nation building. Thus, my son sojourn into early modern Ukrainian history ends where it began with a study of early modern and modern identities. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kovut, for your very interesting lecture and uh, for your detailed, detailed presentation of your future uh, book. Yeah, and uh, we wait for publication, but now uh, welcome any questions, any remarks. Uh, who wants? Uh, Volodymyr Sklokin, uh, Ukrainian Catholic University. Welcome. Yes, thank you, thank you, Maxim. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Zenon for being with us today and for sharing this fascinating story of his academic development. <coughs> I think actually that this is very symbolic that uh, Professor Kovut delivers this keynote address uh, during the first conference of the Ukrainian Society for 18th Century Studies. I think this is really uh, important for us, for all, for, for all of us, because as Professor Yavemenko has already emphasized uh, the important role of the first monograph uh, by, Professor, by Professor Kogut on the development of 18th century studies in Ukraine in the 1990s and early 2000s. And I can only confirm this point because uh, for me personally, the reading of the Russian centralism and uh, Ukrainian autonomy became one of the main historiographic discoveries of my student life. And actually, I think that uh, it is this book which pushed me in the direction of studying the abolition of Sloboda Ukraine's autonomy also in the late 18th century, because I realized that we don't have a comparable to Professor Kogut monograph on this topic. And actually, I'm very grateful uh, for this to Professor Kogut. And, uh, Actually, Mike, I am wondering here now, 
more than 30 years uh, have passed since the publication of the American edition of the Russian Centralism and Ukrainian Autonomy. So uh, how your views on this topic uh, have changed since then? And what would you change or what would you add to this book if you, uh, uh, if you uh, would uh, try to uh, publish a revised edition now? Yes, so uh, what, what changed uh, since the late 80s? Yeah. Okay, um, it's really remarkable that it's like 30 years and uh, there has been no other publication to replace it. That this is really remarkable. Uh, my views at that uh, time, uh, what I would change is, uh, well, there was nothing that uh, no general book on the abolition of Ukrainian autonomy that could re uh, replace it. Uh, a lot of more details have been uh, added now. There have been studies on the um, Hetman Rozumovsky, on uh, uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian elites. So I, what I would change would be a lot of details. Um, uh, but in essence, I think it still holds. I don't know. Maybe others might think otherwise. And uh, I'm surprised, but it still holds as it is. I agree, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Frank Sisson, welcome. Uh, so, Maybe I'll dare because I know more of the personal story, maybe to ask a few, I think, personal questions that might be of interest to people here. Uh, you point out that Alexander Ohoblin was on your thesis committee. I don't think there is anyone now in Ukraine who knew Alexander Ohoblin as a scholar, right? We, we, we now become bearers of a certain tradition you knew uh, uh, Nikola Andrusyak uh, from your time, that is specialist on the 18th century, did not know Natalia, uh, Natalia Polonsky Vasilenko. So maybe if you could say, if you would evaluate the, that uh, both personally and as a scholar, what Hoblin brought, how important that would be for your development, even go a little broader to other I mean, although not an early modern specialist, you were also the student, uh, student of Ivan Lysiak Rudnitsky as an undergraduate. So what did this Ukrainian diaspora historiography mean for you and in, in developing you? Uh, and then, uh, as I remember in writing your thesis, uh, initially at the University of Pennsylvania, there were those who viewed the Ukrainian topic as too narrow and wanted you to do the Baltic areas as well. Uh, maybe you could point out what the attitude was towards, you mentioned Isabella de Madriaga and Mark Rayev, but generally on dealing with Ukrainian topics. All right, so a lot, a lot of questions. <clears throat> um, it is amazing that at the Canadian, at, uh, at Hurry, Harvard Ukrainian uh, Institute, uh, I, was uh, able to associate with uh, Oloblin, who uh, actually uh, gave one course in, uh, 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 in basically Cossack history. Uh, and he also uh, was my advisor. Uh, Oloblin brought an enormous erudition uh, he uh, uh, literally seemed to know all those uh, little Russian families, their genealogies, uh, uh, enormous uh, uh, information, which, you know, coming out of 
Philadelphia, I had absolutely no access to. So he filled out a lot of things. As far as uh, 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 the uh, uh, Hoban's interpretation of things, uh, I, I did not follow uh, him completely. The thing I mean, he um, uh, had this um, uh, wonderful um, phrase. Uh, uh, um, Dobry sen Ukraine, a good son of Ukraine, uh, as a category of uh, for various uh, political leaders. Uh, everything was done for Ukraine, but it wasn't very clear. Um, uh, sometimes the Ukrainian was uh, overshadowed what the early modern categories were what uh, the uh, intentions were. Uh, in other words, uh, much of Ahlaban's uh, uh, knowledge and structure and everything, but it was also nationalized under some sort of current um, Ukrainian national paradigm. Uh, and uh, it, uh, now, the, a national paradigm had something, uh, as I pointed out in my talk, I am not opposed to it in anything, but um, I'm also very much for presenting things as they were in the 17th century uh, and not ascribing uh, 20 or 21st century or 20th century in case of Holoban's motives uh, to these people. So this was a Holoban, but he gave me a very broad perspective on things. I mean, to give you one example, uh, once I've written one of those chapters and uh, it involved uh, 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 the nobility and uh, uh, their um, uh, attempts at uh, uh, restoring some of the um, uh, uh, conditions of, um, of Cossack Ukraine already in the early 19th century. And so uh, we have that battle uh, uh, over this heritage. And I had uh, uh, the worked out who did what and so on. And then it turns out that I confused two people. And I confused them because they had the exact same name in patronymic. So there was no other, you know, but he knew those things. He said, no, this one was uh, actually from there and this one was from here. Uh, uh, so he gave me this, uh, uh, enormous um, um, uh, confidence that at least uh, I am uh, accurate in my uh, 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 in my uh, exposition in terms of names, dates, and things like that. Uh, now you mentioned also uh, uh, Andrushak, the amazing thing at at the, at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute was in the basement was one of the premier historians, <laughs> Mikola Andrushak, uh, also at that time. Um, but I did uh, I didn't have much uh, contact with him directly, but uh, it was an indication of the sort of uh, building. Um, sort of in diaspora, the, the sort of cream of Ukrainian historical studies at that time. Now, uh, you know, you mentioned a lot of other things, but attitudes at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, well, I mean, I had a Professor Alfred J. Reber as my uh, thesis advisor. He was a fair and 
uh, very decent person. I have no thing. But uh, in the array of professors, I had Alexander Rosinowski, who uh, was uh, a, uh, a promoter of uh, uh, the Russian sort of nationalism, a promoter of the grand narrative of Russia, uh, that Ukraine is part and parcel of Russia. I mean, he, he's the, he was the brother of the famous uh, 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 Nicholas Rosinowski, who wrote at that time the uh, major textbook on Russian history. But uh, the, that paradigm, of course, my, what I was starting to do completely opposed that paradigm. And I did have uh, problems, I must admit. Now I can say that uh, uh, I've written uh, one of the chapters is uh, on the Legislative Commission, Katarina Legislative Commission, in which all these uh, 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 estates, uh, the nobles, Cossacks, and even cities wrote these cahiers of their needs and things. So it was a very technical one uh, in which I analyze all of these and uh, most of them, uh, certainly from the nobility, uh, uh, requested uh, again uh, allowing a hetman to be uh, elected and reconstituting some of the uh, uh, things of the hetmanate. Well, uh, so uh, this chapter I presented, I finished, presented, and then it was held up for a year. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the reaper said, well, you know, it was thought that this is, this is very nationalistic, this chapter. <clears throat> so we rework it. <clears throat> and I did. I reworked it by changing some like six words uh, and handed in a year later. And he says, oh, this is like night and day. So this gives you some of the atmosphere at that time. Um, uh, it, it was you really had to s struggle uh, to, uh, for any uh, Ukrainian uh, topic and uh, an early modern topic was the same, uh, no different and even more so sometimes. And what was the other question yet? No, okay. I've exhausted them, sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I see two hands, and uh, first uh, was uh, Professor Penelope from Corfield, our first uh, keynote speaker. Uh, welcome. Uh, and then uh, Professor Tatiana Tayerova Yakolia. Excellent. Thank you so much. I loved the lecture, and I do admire the way you were sweeping up and down the centuries. That is absolutely in the tradition of the 18th century societies. We look backwards, we look forwards, we don't worry about dates. And I remember in one lecture, some student looked up and said, you've just gone beyond 1800 and you've said something before 1700. <laughs> oh, we don't mind. <laughs> but I was going to ask a question. Uh, well, I was very fascinated because I'm working in the 18th century on, on the one hand, the survival of popular cultural identities as in, the stereotype of the English, the Scot, the Welsh, the Irish, but at the same time, the formation of a British identity. Maybe now under threat, you know, different world, different era. I agree with you, these things change over time. But very interestingly, um, these cultural stereotypes and the jokes associated with them go a long way in consolidating this sense of identity. Now, I know you were speaking primarily from the views of the elite society, but they too may be sharing these. And I wonder if there's a, a cultural history of joking and satire that can be used as well, or a sort of affectionate joking, really. It's like a sort of quick way of a, assimilating another people or creating a common identity. 
Uh, but I just say, by the way, these questions have to be addressed with great sensitivity and care. That I was talking to my class, one class about 18th century stereotypes of the Irish, for example, happy-go-lucky, feckless, and the Scots were mean with their money and the Welsh could do nothing but sing. And as I left the lecture, I thought I had made it clear these were all 18th century stereotypes. Well, some older than that, going back to Shakespeare, etc., etc. But as I left, I heard one student saying to another, did you hear what she said about the Irish? So you have to be terribly, terribly careful when discussing these. But in such a sensitive area as you've been describing, you know, are there uh, stereotypical images that come into play and do they have a history too? Well, um, I did not, um, I didn't have resources uh, to study uh, jokes and so on in the 17th and 18th. Uh, 18th century, uh, but I would say that these really appear more in the 19th century already. So, uh, definitely certain stereotypes, they are part of uh, this whole um, uh, of uh, uh, little uh, uh, development of little Russia and Russia. Uh, uh, identities and how they mesh and uh, one, some of the, the sort of stereotypes is uh, of the sort of lazy, uh, uh, clever little Russian trying to deceive the Russian, uh, great Russians and uh, 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 as a uh, uh, the uh, 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 little Russians as the younger brother, the smaller brother, the uh, uh, these kinds of stereotypes uh, emerged. Uh, uh, conversely, the Ukrainians also developed some stereotypes of Russians uh, and uh, that are not uh, very uh, 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 Russians as uh, um, primarily uh, uh, as uh, willing to be enslaved is one of the first things that they are seem to have. Ukrainians are always striving for their liberties. Russians have no concept of liberty. They have no concept of uh, thing uh, of um, uh, uh, and uh, later on uh, on the very sort of peasant like level of being primitive of being uh, um, basically alcoholics and uh, drunkards uh, some of these stereotypes emerge now for a common vision uh, it, it was very difficult to produce a common uh, vision because of uh, you didn't have that uh, in England or in Great Britain. You have a great British uh, sort of overarching thing. In, uh, in this situation, there is no really overarching thing. Uh, in 19th century, there is attempt to say, well, there are the um, uh, the little Russians, the great Russians, and the and the Russians, but the overarching thing is still Russians. Uh, so uh, there was not a um, let's say appropriately neutral overarching concept to include them all in a sort of positive way. I don't know whether that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Professor Tatiana Tayerova Yakuli. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful presentation uh, and very interesting details.
Uh, my question is, you didn't mention Baturin and your great support of this project of archaeological works in Baturin and uh, actually rebirth of uh, uh, Hetman's cap capital. And, uh, and so my question is, uh, what is Baturin and Mazepa uh, means for you and how does this uh, uh, study of uh, Baturin feeds into your new coming book. Thank you very much. Right. <clears throat> well, I was um, promoting this uh, 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 project already for, gosh, I don't know, 15 years or so for excavations in Baturin. Baturin was the capital of Hetman Mazapa, which in uh, 1708 was totally destroyed uh, by the uh, Russians, razed really to the ground, and uh, never really recovered fully since then. But uh, uh, so uh, we were uh, systematically trying to every summer excavate some portion of Baturin and, uh, uh, and basically uh, sort of uh, get an idea of what the uh, Hetman's capital looked like, uh, get uh, access to some of the artifacts that are still thing. Uh, and it is a uh, really a project also in cultural history of uh, uh, the early modern Ukraine, since we're dealing with all these artifacts and uh, so on. The project uh, uh, is, is uh, based, well, we have uh, a, a component, uh, a Canadian component, uh, that's Professor Mazensev, and then we, uh, do um, uh, the Chunihu State University with uh, their archaeologists, and uh, every summer they do this uh, dig uh, using the students of their university and other universities. Um, so uh, um, it is a project that I initiated. And although I am no longer uh, part of, well, I am part of CIS in a way, but no longer at the university, I still am part of the project. I, uh, uh, I am still the advisor and uh, every year we try to figure out, you know, what we can do, what we can do, how many students will be there, uh, what should, what portion of that should be dug up. Uh, the usual procedure is to uh, dig these up in the summer and then cover them for the rest of the year until next year for the next portion of the, uh, of the project. Um, so, uh, so that's the project. Well, Mazepa is a, a key in my uh, studies as well in the new uh, book. Uh, studies. I have a chapter called the Mazepin Synthesis, which is a very interesting, uh, uh, well, I hope it will be interesting for you. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think it has um, ever, be, ever been presented that way. A symbiosis, Mazepa was trying, a symbiosis of a, the uh, uh, um, uh, political culture of the uh, Kievan clergy, the the Cossacks, and uh, 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 and creating this kind of um, uh, and, and trying to create a sort of a sacral uh, uh, hetmanship that is incorporating various. Uh, um, um, sacral ideologies into his political uh, 
thought and a program such as New Jerusalem, Kiev is New Jerusalem, uh, Saint Sophia, uh, and things like that. It is an amazing attempt at a synthesis of everything. Uh, of course, it could not work because uh, he was, uh, uh, Mazepa had the fortune and fortune of being part of uh, the reign of Peter the first. And ultimately there was a different uh, uh, approach reform. So uh, it, uh, Mazepa's idea of having a sort of a, a sacred hetman that is a junior ruler of an autonomous uh, uh, little Russia, Ukraine, uh, just could not uh, work on uh, and that uh, the idea just couldn't work uh, and led to the uh, epicolet in Poltava. Uh, the interesting part later on is uh, his uh, uh, secretary or uh, chancellor uh, Orlik, who was uh, one of the creators of this Mazepin synthesis, later totally reversed it by cutting out the Russian uh, thing and so on. And uh, you have the, the Orlik uh, uh, synthesis uh, of a already more secular uh, elected ruler of a totally autonomous country uh, that uh, and a theory uh, that it, it has nothing to do with Russia and the Russians and that's introducing the Khazar myth that in essence, uh, the Russians and Ukrainians do not have a common heritage. Uh, the Cossacks go much further to the ancient Khazars and things. So um, uh, these are sort of interesting, um, uh, I would say opposite poles of uh, the development uh, of Ukrainian political thought. Uh Thank you very much. Uh, uh, our Zoom is unlimited and it's a great uh, opportunity to ask Professor Kohut again and again, but from the other hand, uh, um, uh, it's time to say goodbye according to our schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, let me uh, uh, pay your attention that we used uh, uh, we use uh, two official languages and maybe the last question will be in Ukrainian. I don't know uh, who is uh, Natalia HD, uh, but uh, I see that ah uh, <laughs> Professor Natalia <laughs> Professor Natalia Pelopiuk. Okay, uh, 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 maybe in uh, English, maybe in Ukrainian, maybe in Spanish and uh, many other languages is the last question. Uh, welcome, good luck yes. upon you. Thank you. Well, I will start in Ukrainian, but if need be, I can translate into English. Zenku, shtiro dyakui za chudovi pitsumok svojih naukovih rubit, tvoja perša knjiška še stojit u mene, i ja neju koristuju se duže často, zvrtaju se do neji. Ти мав важливий вплив на мій розвиток. Але у мене є маленькі питання щодо церковної еліти Галичини в середині XVIII століття. Мене цікаво, чи ти включаєш ідентичність або погляди таких людей, як Атанасій Шептицький, який помер, у XVIII столітті. Я зараз перекладу на англійську. Thank you, Zenon, your book is still with me and I consult it very often. 
and you've had a tremendous impact on my life. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, whether you study or will, whether you will be talking about it in your next book is the identity or the intellectual um, views of the uh, Bazilian, especially, but the Greek Catholic clergy uh, in the 18th century, specifically, I mean, Athanasius Sheptychki, who was not only uh, a bishop of Lviv, but he was the Archbishop of Kiev and, and so forth. The reason I'm asking, and I will be very precise, the, the funeral panegyric in his honor praises him, works very hard to make him uh, a Sarmatian. Uh, in other words, it emphasizes his Sarmatian culture, the Sarmatian um, clans. And it, at one point, uh, the, uh, one of the mourners in, in one of the verses, and this is all written in Latin, says it is too bad that Lachesis cut the life uh, of this person who was meant to live in the sun uh, and who attacked the Sarmatian nest, which is a neighboring nest to the Polish crown. So from the Latin, if I understand it correctly, it appears that he places uh, 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 Szeptycki as a neighbor to, but not within Poland. I was a bit uh, taken aback by this, and I want to know whether you have any ideas, whether you ha can comment on it at all. All right, um, as far as um, um, my studies are concerned, I do not go outside of the sort of central Ukraine, so I would not be uh, covering uh, Sheptitsky. But on the Sarmatian myth, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, it depends what you, what do you mean by the Sarmatian myth? Do you mean the Sarmatian myth uh, as expressed in 19th century uh, Polish historians that the uh, uh, Polish nobility has is uh, uh, came uh, from the Sarmatians, and uh, the, therefore the Sarmatians, uh, the uh, Poles have, uh, our the Polish nobility is exclusively the nation, um, and the others, uh, the peasants, and so on, are uh, either been conquered by the Sarmatians or had been, uh, uh, um, but they are uh, not of the same ethnic origin. So uh, that kind, that myth uh, is, uh, I think, been challenged uh, completely, that this is really a 19th century Polish historian's invention, that there is uh, in the, 17th century sources, there is no uh, mention of the exclusivity of the Sarmatians, uh, uh, the Sarmatian origins exclusively to the nobility. Uh, I don't know what bearing that could have on your uh, think on Sarmatians, but uh, and Sheptitsky, but that's the only thing I can tell you about it. I don't know. The Latin author of this particular panegyric does not make it very clear. So I was hoping to find some clues uh, why it is important for him to elevate Sheptitsky as a member of the Sarmatian, as an eaglet in the Sarmatian nest, which is not within Poland, but next to Coterminus. And I, I was fascinated by this idea, and I, I'm still re researching it. Mm, okay, thank you all. I uh, don't see any hands. Uh, okay. Mm. So 
it's time to say goodbye. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Professor Kohut. Uh, uh, thank thank you. you all. Uh, uh, it was uh, um, a very good and excellent finish of our second uh, conference day. Uh, and it was the last uh, keynote uh, uh, presentation. But uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a set day uh, tomorrow, uh, very interesting. And uh, welcome to join uh, the panels. Uh, welcome to discuss. And thank you for your participation at this conference. And uh, see you tomorrow.